few pirate ships could match the fifth great flagship of Henry Every, the Fancy. Sailing at the head of a five ship armada, she dwarfed the lesser sloops and brigantines, so common with pirates. Few opponents dared to resist her, and those who did soon faced a brutal, 23 gun broadside. Her decks overflowed with battle hardened scoundrels, expert at the sword and musket alike. With these tools and this ship, the crew of the Fancy sailed halfway around the world and back, taking one of the richest prizes in all of history, and faded into obscurity. But the story of the Fancy did not begin on a Bahamian shoreline, in battle against an Indian flagship, or a dramatic mutiny. It began in a shipyard. Few pirates ever had the luxury to build their own ship. At best they might refit an old vessel to their purposes. When Henry Every claimed the Fancy as his flagship, one might have been able to smell the freshness of the wood. She had been built the previous year and named Charles II, not after the King of England, who was dead at this point, but the King of Spain, Carlos II. But why would an English ship be named after a Spanish king? The story begins with a London merchant and an empty coffer. The coffer belonged to a war-torn state. The merchant's name was Sir James Hublin. He had grown his fortune by importing wine and groceries from Spain, and had managed to acquire a trading and salvage license from the Spanish monarch. What would he do with his license? England and Spain were currently at war with France. French pirates and smugglers were interloping in Spanish territories abroad, and they were too much for the local coast guards to handle. Hublon proposed that he could amass an expedition to deal with it, and in return receive a lion's share of any loot. Additionally, the salvaging part of the license allowed him to recover the wrecks of Spanish treasure galleons. This was most likely inspired by an earlier expedition by William Phipps, which had proved very successful. Hublin gathered a group of investors, and together they purchased and outfitted a tree of small ships, the Dove, James, and Seventh Son. However, none of them were large enough to become a flagship, so they had to build one. It is not known how long the construction took, or how costly it was, but the result was a fast and agile ship of force, mounted with 40 guns, a so-called fifth rate. The Charles, or Fancy, as I'll call her for convenience, was built during an exciting time for shipbuilding. Judging by her amount of cannon, she would have been a fifth rate of the new classifications, designed in 1689. This has been regarded as the birth of the first real frigates, a strong, heavily armed ship specialized in cruising, a perfect balance between durability, firepower, and speed. In other words, the perfect privateer. Let's take a look at what the Charles might have looked like. I asked Aaron from my Discord server for assistance in illustrating the vessel. We took a look at some contemporary fifth rates to envision a likely design of the fancy, and these are the results. If you want to take a look at more of his artwork, or even commission him yourself, check out at l 3 nozzlenose on Instagram or Twitter, x, whatever. Or hit him up on Discord age-free underscore nozzle nose. Let's see what he was able to cook up. The Fancy would have had a tonnage of around 400 and a length of between 90 to 110 feet, 27 to 33 meters. Inspired by earlier galley frigates, these new frigates had a considerable length to breadth ratio. Even though they weren't designed specifically for rowing, it was a measure to improve speed. These innovative new frigates designed by Lord Torrington had a bigger emphasis on their all-weather capabilities, habitability, and sailing qualities. The first was improved by increasing the freeboard to the gun ports, making water less likely to enter the ship. Habitability was improved by making the lower decks more clear and ventilated for the crew's conditions. By setting the lower deck at the waterline, the height of the side was reduced and made the ship more weatherly, improving her sailing qualities. As a full-rigged ship, the Fancy would have had three masts, primarily rigged with square sails. The bowsprit would have had a spritsail, a sprit topmast with a sprit topsail, three courses on the foremast, three on the main, and on the mizzen a triangular mizzen sail, and possibly a square mizzen topsail. Like all fifth traits, the Fancy would have had two gun decks. The upper gun deck was divided between the exposed weather deck, the fortified forecastle, and the protected quarter deck. The weather deck housed the majority of the ship's armaments, around 26 pounders, 
The sheltered quarter deck housed a smaller battery of around 6 3 pounders. During this period, it was quite common to mount guns inside of the captain's quarters. The heavy artillery was mounted on the lower gun deck for the sake of stability. These would have been around 18 9 pounders. The fanciest guns would have been loaded with all sorts of devilish shot, ranging from the ordinary cannonball to canister, bar, and chain. During her legendary battle with the gun sway, a pirate cannon managed to sever the Mughal's mainmast. This feat is often attributed to luck. It's often believed that the pirates fired their artillery directly into the hull of an enemy ship. However, to pierce the hull of a ship as large as the gunsway, you would have needed heavier pieces, at least 18 pounders, twice the weight of the shot of what a fifth rate like the fancy was usually armed with. A relevant incident was documented about 12 years later by privateer Captain Woods Rogers. When engaging a 900 ton manila ship, similar in size to the gunsway, the privateers fired roughly 500 round shots from their 6 pounder cannons, never being able to pierce the enemy's hull. But during the 7 hour fight, the enemy's rigging was utterly torn to shreds. So was it a lucky round shot that fell the gunsway's mainmast? Or was it an anti-rigging specialist shot like bar, hammer, langrel or chain? They fought at a distance, so maybe bullets were the only viable shot. It's also likely that they didn't train their guns on the hull at all but only on the rigging, for the specific purpose of felling the masts. What about small arms? She would have no doubt been supplied with ample amounts of fireworks, a period term for incendiary and explosive weapons, swords, axes, and pikes. When the fancy was handed over as a gift to Nicholas Trott of Nassau, it was documented that she had aboard 100 barrels of gunpowder, small arms which were for the ship's use, and several chests of buccaneer guns. The buccaneer gun, also called boucanière, was originally a hunting musket favored by the boucanier of Saint-Domingue, hence the name. It had an absurdly long barrel. Your average musket of the period had a length of 58 inches, 1.5 meters, whereas the boucanière could range over 6 feet, mugging the contemporary average male height of 66 inches, 167 centimeters. And in period illustrations, the musket is usually shown as taller than its buccaneer wielder. They were said to have greater accuracy, and it didn't take long for them to become a standard firearm within naval forces, and would remain so until the mid-18th century. Among pirates, it was a favorite, especially the buccaneers, among whom Every had drawn many of his recruits and compatriots. He is speculated to have been a buccaneer himself, and they all would have been proficient in the use of this arm, and the act of birding, picking off enemies with great precision. These weapons would also be sold as a trade commodity to indigenous communities. When the Charles had been built, the expedition sailed to Coruna in Spain, where Every led a mutiny and seized the vessel. Their first act was to change the name from Charles II to the Fancy. The Charles had not been named after the now dead King of England, rather, Rey Carlos de España, <laughs> nicknamed the Bewitched. He was said to be a good marksman, but otherwise, well, his autopsy report recorded that his heart was the size of a peppercorn, his lungs corroded, his intestines rotten and gangrenous, he had a single testicle black as coal, and his head was full of water. As can be seen on his sexy Squidward portrait, he carried the distinctive Habsburg jaw, a sign of several generations worth of inbreeding. Worst of all, he was Spanish, which the buccaneers weren't too fond of. Every had her sail to Bayoko off the African coast, where the fancy was beached, careened, her hull clean from barnacles, and the superstructure modified. Once again, let's take a look at Aaron's illustrations to see what these modifications may have looked like. Pirates found several issues in the designs of contemporary frigates. At their basic level, they consisted of a hull, a bilge, a cargo hold, an orlop for storing cables, a lower gun deck, and a second gun deck. So far, the pirates had no issues. However, on top of these decks were added a raised aftercastle, housing the steerage and the great cabin. Upon the quarter deck was added a master's cabin, called the roundhouse. The great cabin was additionally environed with a frivolous set of balconies or windows, called the galleries. Additionally, the stern of the ship was fashioned with a bunch of heavy, gilded art, called the carved works. The whole purpose of the Baroque era starting in the late 16th century, was to awe the onlooker with as much bombastic art as possible. Ships like the Vase and Soleil Royale 
were seen as floating propaganda pieces meant to flaunt the wealth and prestige of the monarchy. This came at the cost of performance. Additional weight made the ship slower, and console sections sticking out of the ship's main chassis increased windage, made it less aerodynamic. Of course, the frivolous art did receive critique during the period, and eventually in the 18th century, ships would become less detailed and sleeker in design, performance being preferred, but pirates were far ahead of the schedule. Their ships could often be recognized from a distance, owing to the lack of galleries. According to the East India Company, Every had taken down a great deal of his upper work and made her exceedingly snug, but they didn't specify what parts or how much of the fancy was received exactly, leaving us to speculate. Most certainly, they removed the carved works, the roundhouse, and the galleries. These parts were the most crippling, frivolous, and unnecessary. What did the carved works include exactly? The figurehead, circular decorations around the gun ports, and the artwork upon the stern of the ship. These artworks could get quite silly by the way, baroque you might say, stuff like paintings of harbors or even ships, so you'd have a ship decorated with… a ship. However, every might have gone further. They could have cut down the after castle and maybe even the forecastle, then opening up the main deck to expose the upper battery below, making it a new weather deck. Weather deck refers to any decks exposed to the open sky. This would have given the most optimal speed but it would have provided some drawbacks. For one, every and his officers would have lost their private quarters, in which they could relax, have a chat, enjoy a private meal and, most importantly, make plans which they could not share with the rest of the crew. If a plan leaked out, it could get into enemy hands. Less of an issue when you're primarily at sea, but it could still happen if the pirates hit port, if someone got left behind or decided to betray the company. But removing the cabins could also be seen as a sort of political act, putting the officers on equal footing with the rest of the crew, forcing them to share the exact same conditions, which may have been preferred in some pirate companies. On the contrary, a lot of pirates did employ a strict hierarchy, and even the rougher sort were documented as keeping the cabins for the officers' use. However, they most certainly took down the bulkheads, internal partitions creating rooms for storage and such. These added overall weight to the ship, and during a sea battle could be dangerous, so it was standard procedure on men of war to have them taken down. Pirates would often keep their ships in a state of perpetual readiness, always having the guns loaded, so permanently removing bulkheads would have been part of this process. By removing the upper decks, the helm, the steering mechanism, would have been exposed. In the late 17th century, ships like the Fancy were steered by whipstaffs, little more than a pivoting pole directly attached to the tiller which in turn controlled the rudder. It might seem preferable to open up the decks and give the helmsman a better vision of where he's steering. For the most part, whipstaffs were entirely concealed or allowed slight vision through a little window called the helmsman's shelter. But perhaps surprisingly, the helmsman did not really need vision to steer the ship. He simply needed to be given commands by the captain, who would never steer the ship himself. Exposing the whipstaff could, however, exposed the helmsman to enemy fire. Killing the helmsman and officers was one of the most common tactics in order to throw the enemy into disarray. No one steers the ship? Hmm, kind of a bad deal. If things got too hot on the helm, the helmsman could be replaced, or they could even run below deck, cut the whipstaff, and control the ship directly via the tiller. A ship which was completely or close to having a straight deck from stem to stern was called flushed. These were less defensible. A common tactic was to fortify the forecastle and aftercastle and lure boarding parties into a killing zone in between. If the weather deck was lowered to the upper gun deck, the gun crews there would not be shielded from enemy fire or boarding parties. It would also be more difficult to organize boarding offenses from it, as you'd have artillery and implements lying about, and also harder to position musketeers. Around the year 1700, English frigates were built with a spar deck covering the upper gun deck below but it was primarily a defensive measure against boarding parties, much utilized, and effectively so, by the French. Defense was not an issue for pirates, as they operated on the offense. However, giving ample space for musketeers to operate from was of vital concern, and often a reason for cutting down unnecessary sections. It might seem advantageous for musketeers to have raised sections to stand and fire down from, but it was better to have more space instead, 
and for elevated positions the masts were used, for a select few shooters. Of course, if you had a bunch of cannons lying around, being fired, needing men to operate, that would have blocked the musketeers as well. Thus, it's hard to estimate exactly how many decks they would have shaved off the fancy. In 1681, a group of buccaneers documented how they took down the upper deck and sank the quarter deck of their ship of a similar size and comparable construction to the fancy. However, this ship did not carry any great guns and would not have had to take it into consideration. Speed and combat ability are the most apparent reasons for raseeing a ship, but geography also had to be taken into mind. The aforementioned buccaneers who raseed their deck so lowly did so because they were about to cross the Strait of Magellan in South America, a stormy and dangerous voyage requiring a highly maneuverable and seaworthy ship. A more flushed vessel was simply safer in a stormy environment. If it's less top-heavy, it's less likely to tip over on the side. The Fancy found herself in a similar situation, being about to cross the Cape of Good Hope, an undertaking famously dangerous during this period, so seeing her beforehand would have been a safety measure. Whether the Fancy was simply trimmed or almost gutted to the waterline, she would have been made exceedingly fast. Several accounts attest to her speed. In 1695, a group of East Indiamen gave her chase. They reported the following. Our honor ships going into that island gave him chase, but he was too nimble for them by much, having taken down a great deal of his upper work and made her exceedingly snug, which advantage being added to her well sailing before causes her to sail so hard now that she fears not who follows her. Most pirates favored or only had access to much smaller vessels, like sloops and brigantines. At the mouth of the Red Sea, Henry Every organized a six-ship pirate armada, of whom the Fancy was the flagship. All of these vessels were much smaller than the Fancy, but only one, the Portsmouth Adventure, was able to keep up with her, and that was possibly only because one of the smaller ships was towed behind the Fancy, weighing her down. Even the sloop Amity, a legendary Bermuda sloop which had crossed the Atlantic and taken a large Mughal ship on her own, was unable to outrun her. The Fancy did not engage in many battles, none of which were especially long. At Cape Verde, a group of English merchantmen surrendered as soon as she opened her lower tier of gun ports. Off the coast of Guinea, she battled two Danish merchant ships, both of whom carried between 20 to 30 guns. It might have seemed like a formidable opponent, and though the Danes resisted bravely for about an hour, they were defeated with four or five losses, having only killed a single pirate. Her second battle occurred en route from the Red Sea to India, against a large but poorly armed Fateh Muhammad. The Mughal was given a broadside, boarded and taken. Next, the Fancy tracked down and engaged her greatest prize and greatest battle, the Ganji Sawai. The Gunsway, as she was called in English, carried around 60 cannon and weighed almost twice as much as the Fancy. She towered above the pirate, and climbing aboard would have been akin to scaling a castle wall. The Fancy fired a warning shot to demand the Mughal surrender. As a response, the Mughal hoisted the imperial flag and fired both of her heavy stern guns. Soon the two vessels came side by side and began a bombardment at around 100 to 200 yards distance. Another consequence of the Fancy's lowering was that higher ships like the Gunsway struggled at actually hitting her, and though the pirates sustained casualties, it doesn't seem as though they were grievous during the initial phase of the battle. Though the Fancy was well armed, her six and nine pounders would have been unable to pierce the hull of a ship as thick as the Gunsway. Instead, they trained their guns on the Gunsway's rigging, with the intent to disable her. One lucky shot managed to sever the Grand Mogul's mainmast, crippling the other masts as a result and making her near impossible to handle. Meanwhile, one of the Mughal cannons blew up in an accident, killing four men and demoralizing the rest. The pirates saw their chance. They closed in. Many of the fighting tops would have suppressed the Indians with fireworks and musketry. The boarding party threw over grappling hooks and climbed aboard. After a bloody melee, the gunsway had been conquered. The battle between the Fancy and Gunsway has been depicted in a few pieces of media. Most quoted would be this engraving from 1734. Many would believe that the Fancy is the massive battleship opening fire on the right, but it is in fact the smaller vessel on the left. The larger ship is the Gunsway. She is most often portrayed as a European built vessel, an East Indiaman. It is not known for certain what kind of vessel the Gunsway was, her construction doesn't appear to have been documented. 
she could either have been an Indian interpretation of western vessels, or an indigenous Arabian or Indian design, with fore and aft sails and a sleeker design. The depravity which followed the capture of the gunsway has been relegated to a separate previous video about Captain Every himself. The passengers were severely abused. Surely, the blood would have required considerable effort to scrub away. Human bodies contain up to six liters of blood, and when a single man is shot in the street it doesn't look like too much, but a ship like the Fancy was tight and narrow and utterly packed. The blood would have ramped up into little floods, pouring out the scuppers and the sides of the ship. When the pirates had had their fun, they took their loot and let the prizes go. The Fancy sailed south, rounded the Cape of Good Hope, and crossed the Atlantic over to America. The fact that she was able to make the journey from London to northern Spain, then to the Indian Ocean and then to America, needing only to be cleaned twice, having survived two firefights, and with no complaints of her handling or seaworthiness, attests to the quality of the ship. She could have been the sort of pirate vessel to conquer the seas or capture hundreds of prizes, but she didn't need to. The fancy alone carried more treasure than Blackbeard, Sam Bellamy or Bartholomew Roberts could ever dream of. Her purpose had been fulfilled. Now, Avery had to get rid of her. On April Fool's Day, 1696, the fancy arrived on the Bahamian island of Eleuthera. Avery wrote a letter to Governor Trott, offering the ship as a bribe in return for the pirate's protection and anonymity. Of course, Avery used an alias and didn't say they were pirates, but slave traders that had been trading in Africa without permission from the Royal African Company. In addition, he'd receive a bribe of, of 860 pounds, almost thrice the amount of a governor's yearly salary. Trot was in bad need of such a vessel. His capital of Nassau lay under constant threat of a French assault, and a fifth-rate frigate, supply of weapons and veteran men would provide a great asset to his defenses. Of course, seeing the damages to the ship and type of cargo she carried, Trot knew she was a pirate. After her long and hard voyage, the fancy was finally in poor condition. Trot spent the best part of June picking her clean, unloading all the cargo, removing the valuable rigging, anchors and cannons. Shortly before Every departed for Ireland, Trot had a fancy beached on Hog Island, a long strip of land lying in front of Nassau Harbour. Mariners who passed through recognized her as Charles II, the famous privateer turned into an infamous pirate ship. Then, as the hulk laid withering on the shore, so too did she fade away from the records. It's unknown for how long the carrion of the fancy would have lain on that beach. The locals had a tendency of harvesting shipwrecks for building material. Perhaps she witnessed the Franco-Spanish raids of the 1700s, and how the town was made desolate, how the fort fell into ruins. Perhaps she saw the entrance of Benjamin Hornigold as he rebirthed the town into the Pirate Republic. Perhaps Hornigold and the other pirates who entered Nassau paid respects, maybe a sort of pilgrimage to the legendary flagship of their idol. Henry Avery. Perhaps her bones even saw the entrance of Woods Rogers and the end of the pirate age she had partly inspired. One of the Nassau pirates escaped the pirate hunters of the Caribbean. He took off to Africa in the spring of 1719, capturing a number of slave ships. His name was Edward England. He was known to be especially kind and likely a bit of a romantic. Like Henry Avery, he sailed east to the Indian Ocean, hoping to make his fortune. When he captured a 34-gun ship, he crowned her his man of war and rechristened her Fancy. England was later deposed for his meekness. He fled to Madagascar, where he lived out his days among the old pirates, many of whom had served with Henry Every himself. One can only imagine the stories they would have told of that legendary flagship, the Fancy. As usual, thank you to my generous supporters over on Patreon. Patreon supporters get early access to my videos and can watch them without ads. And if you want to interact with fellow pirate enthusiasts, check out the link to our Discord server in the video description. Cheerio!